and CONCON and decided for a CONAS. But in any case, uh, we haven't heard from Senator Trilon and we did invite him here, but unfortunately, I don't. I think he's out of the country. Um, in his uh, in his proposal, uh, he, he had certain criteria for those who would be elected as delegates of the CONCON, and one of these was uh, is that they do not belong to any political party, are not endorsed even by any civic organization. So they actually run on their own uh, with, of course, their agenda of what constitutional change they want to bring. And in that sense, uh, could ensure a non-partisan, a less, less political, politically, you know, when we say politics here, we actually mean the uh, politics of the moment uh, with the political alignments according to the power balance, um, uh, a more non-political uh, process and something that would be more uh, legitimate in that sense because it's not driven by short-term vested interests of politicians and uh, political parties. So uh, I think there's an additional clause about not being related to anyone who ran in the last election and uh, it's an incentive, you know, it's, a, it's some kind of a level the playing field so that uh, not the usual suspects actually come in and uh, basically makes elections for CONCON useless because you have the same kind of people anyway that you have now in Congress. Um, but the question really has to do with that, uh, should the con, who, should people doing the Constitution be non-partisan in that sense and not be associated with any political party, especially in a context where political parties are very weak anyway. I mean, uh, most of the people have not, have now shifted to the real party. They just, change political parties as soon as this pre the president was elected, they all joined this political party. I mean, most of them, not all, but a lot of them. Thank you very much. A very interesting question uh, that I fear I'm not going to be able to respond fully because I don't know the Philippine context. Um, of course, as well as, as you do. Um, I think one of the interesting things that came out of this two-day conference uh, yesterday and the day before was the need for, uh, for this political party reform bill to go through. And this is because, um, as I understood, there is a real enormous crisis of representation uh, of political parties here in the Philippines. Uh, which is the reason why there is so much distrust towards the constituent assembly. Um, because it will be exactly the same representatives actually writing a document that should serve for future generations. And people, as I understood, are not that very confident that those politicians will have the greater good in mind and rather have their own uh, personal interests in mind. Um, so in that sense, I completely understand the question of should uh, the, the constituent assembly or the people drafting uh, the constitution not be politically related. Uh, usually the way it works is with, with a commission. Um, a commission is a commission of experts uh, that m most of the times do not necessarily have um, links to political parties. And so it would not be very far-fetched to actually um, put in the TORs of this uh, Constitutional Commission uh, that they should not have any links to political parties. On the other hand, as you said as well, political parties here in the Philippines are very weak. Um, so the ideological basis that would sort of underscore um, these uh, members of this Constitutional Commission as the members of political parties would really not, not be there. Um, so it's rather about ensuring that those people part of this commission uh, would have this great good in mind, and would be people that actually know what they're doing, are experts in whatever field is necessary um, for this drafting committee, um, rather than perhaps um, being too stringent about uh, those criteria like not being a member of a political party. I would prefer to have a member of a political party um, if this person is capable of actually writing a good constitution and is capable of, of looking ahead uh, to future constitution, uh, to future generations and what they uh, might want to see in the constitution, uh, then have someone that is not a member of a political party uh, but maybe is not able either uh, to look at the future. So this would be my response, which is not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, well, um, maybe just from the context of Myanmar, I mean, I think uh, that reflection that uh, a constitu uh, constituent assembly can still invoke um, input and participation from a wide range of stakeholders. So it doesn't have to be. Um, you can have a kind of hybrid approach, I guess, within within the parameters of a constituent assembly. Would be my um, observation. Thinking about the way things seem to be developing in Myanmar in terms of the debate around how to reform um, a, a rather problematic constitution there. Thank you. I think the question is excellent and very intriguing. Should the constitutional drafting be done by politi politicians or non-politicians and from my vantage, vantage point in Finland and Europe in general I think it would be most unusual if not politicians were involved. However, there is an interesting example of Iceland in this, uh, in this context where the population grew totally disillusioned with the politicians, basically kicked them out together with the bankers who drove Iceland to bankruptcy, practically speaking. And, uh, and they wanted to have a new constitution. What did they do when they were so tired of the politicians? Well, it actually, uh, it actually ended up being a, a, a social media project where, where the population sent in their preferred proposals to, 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 to constitutional provisions. And, and it was a very open participatory process. Um, Iceland still does not have any new constitution. So I guess that there's a problem with that sort of a process. Somebody has to manage it in the proper way, but, but I still uh, would think that there's a lot to be said about also direct popular input to the process, which would be somehow caught up by those who draft the constitution. So why don't your students also, while studying the, the old constitutions, uh, write the draft yourselves and, and submit it. <laughs> Yes, Mike. I think that's nervous laughter because we have, uh, we have uh, maybe two more months into the semester and I can still consider that being part of the assignment for the semester. So, so very slowly I'm, I'm seeing either averted eyes or uh, nervous laughter. <laughs> well, I, just to share, but um, in one of my classes, we didn't do a rewriting, but we did an exercise at the beginning of the class that would effectively ask groups to draw up, um, well, they didn't know it at the time, but it, it actually asked them to draw up certain rules around governance, resource sharing, but it was intended to introduce the subject, meaning the subject is not just a matter of reading the provisions, reading the cases, and then, but hopefully introduce the subject as very important because it, it is uh, the structural organization of government uh, with which we deal every day uh, for our most basic, basic needs. Um, I'm not sure which version that I had read, but there was one version that uh, was shared with me uh, which would permit those who have, even those who have been elected to office to participate in an election, but then they would have to, as part of, I think, submitting their, their candidacy, um, of course, forfeit the seat that they won, uh, as well as resign from the particular uh, political party, and then also provide, uh, I'm not sure though, which body will assess the viability of their campaign platform, but they were supposed to submit a platform uh, on the constitutional amendments um, or modifications that they would like to pursue if elected. Um, I think the rationale behind it is that we cannot foreclose um, the participation entirely, particularly those who um, although they may now have shared in the notori notoriety of the political interests in Congress, uh, do not necessarily have uh, those uh, vested interests and have demonstrated a capacity for um, an appreciation of 
the function of a constitution and therefore would be able to viably participate and contribute to the work of constitution making. But I'm not sure now whose version that is that, that, that I had read. If I would make a comment still from from the point of view of, of, of excluding uh, persons from running who are members of, of political parties for uh, placing in the Constitutional Convention, I would see there's kind of a human rights problem there under Article 25 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, that's right to stand, and that, that, it, that right to stand also implies a right of association, I think right of association to a political party, so you might want to uh, figure out if this at all is possible to require. I mean, to, 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 to require that the person is not a member of any party, any, any political association. I think that there may be a complication there. Just one, one more comment. Um, I just came from last week leading a workshop in Yangon on um, education and federalism. So this was just one particular sector, education. And it was working with members of the Karen community, and as you probably know, Myanmar is characterised by a high level of ethno-linguistic diversity. The Karen are one of the main nationality groups. So um, it was leaders of the community, ethnic armed organisations, of which there are three from the Karen, um, political parties, a couple of different Karen political parties, and a number of civil society members. And they were trying to, they asked me to lead the workshop to develop some positions which these different stakeholders could then take into an envisaged process of political dialogue in Myanmar, which is part of the peace process, which will probably inform the formation of the constitution. Anyway, the point being that the, the way that this group chose to approach things, which seems to be quite valuable, is of course, this, even within this community, there's such a variety of different opinions and different levels of knowledge regarding the issues. So we worked towards developing some principles. We broke down the education sector, primary, tertiary education, for example, different types of education approach, and to develop some common principles for the group. And among very diverse stakeholders working on issues which the actual, I'm presuming, the actual writing of a constitution requires a high level of technical legal competence, but I think you can still have a much larger input that's framed in terms of the principles within which uh, a constitution can then be developed. Any other questions? Neglected child of this, this current dialogue, this current conversation on constitutional amendment, on this economic rights, on the economic provisions of our constitution. Um, it's, yeah, it's understandable that in the hierarchy of, of rights, economic rights are given um, less priority, you know, are, are considered below a political and civil rights. Um, nevertheless, I think a good framing, framing of the economic provisions of the constitution can lead to a better economy, which in turn will will allow Filipinos, allow citizens um, better access or better enjoyment, full enjoyment of their civil and political rights. So my question is, you know, we, all, we all are aware of how the economic provisions of the Philippine Constitution are structured. We are aware that these, these provisions were actually introduced way back in the 1935 Constitution. And we are aware of this view that, that these provisions have functioned as some kind of straight jacket. Um, straight jacket against economic development. So my question has to do with is this this kind of economic provisions, are they unique to the Philippines or are, do they exist in constitutions of other countries? Um, do you believe that's the first question. Second question is do you believe that having such kind of economic provisions or economic provisions in general in constitutions, is this a is this a passe concept? And third because it's been it's been the problem ever since. Since constitutional change, the charter change was introduced way back in in the term of President Estrada. Charter change has always been catered towards the economic provisions of the constitution. And it's never happened. In case 
this exercise and constitutional amendment still does not bear fruit. Is there, what are extra constitutional measures that have been undertaken by other countries to, to veer away or to, to, to circumvent economic provisions that are stated in the Constitution? Thank you. Can you specify what those measures are? Okay. Those provisions are? okay, these measures have to do with measures that limit foreign equity or foreign participation in select sectors of the, of Philippine, the Philippine economy. This includes mass media, um, the ownership of land, uh, public utilities, education, and several other industries. Essentially, um, the limitations vary depending on the industry, but in essence, the result of, of, of these provisions is to create a more, is to foster a more protectionist economy, an economy, an economy that favors uh, Philippine investment and at the same time um, limits or prohibits foreign investment. investors find semi-legal ways of getting round. For example, the Thailand constitution makes it very clear that foreigners cannot own land or property. And, uh, not me personally, but I know a few people who basically own houses, they own land. I mean, partly it's through informal arrangements with uh, Thailand citizens. There are different complicated legal structures where the land is leased for a very long period of time, the buildings are owned by the individuals, so it's a very partial answer because it's not really, I think, satisfying the question, but I, I think in Thailand, and this is beginning to be the case in Myanmar, there are grey areas which uh, people can exploit. Even uh, corporations. Yeah, thank, thanks. That's, I think it's an excellent question. And I think that was um, it was quite fashionable in the 1960s and 70s to to design constitutions in newly developed, newly independent countries that had come out of con con colonial situations, where where um, economics was somehow the, the main element, often, very often under. Uh, Kind of a principle of socialism or, or some sort of an ism in that country. So I mean that certainly, certainly is a is a is a known constitutional feature. It has been very common, I think, even. And, and there is also some uh, international uh, uh, treaty law that that uh, tries to create equity between developed countries and developing countries in investments and protection, but also in protection of investment. So, I mean, this is a bundle of, of issues that the law has tried to cover and, and deal with in, in many ways. Um, and, and there was a, even an academic uh, discussion about, uh, about uh, uh, so to say, the sovereign uh, country's right to own its natural resources and even, even the right to self-determination in, in, in Common Article 1 is to some extent geared in, in, in subsection 2 towards this sort of economic issues. So, I mean, there's certainly kind of a tendency uh, from, from before to, to have, to make possible this sort of, of economic arrangements. It's nothing new, uh, but as was said, um, foreign investment is normally important for different countries and, and, and where these sort of inhibitions have been in place, ways and means have been found to circumvent them. There may be some sort of uh, crony companies established in the country uh, that fulfill the legal requirements but then you know the traffic traffic otherwise of, of capital is free or if the, if, the, if the traffic of capital movement of capital is somehow restricted uh, ways and means of, of, of uh, exchanging the commodities have been found and actually result in the same so no country has been really very successful in maintaining that sort of and I trust that's also the case in the Philippines. Those who 
But there's always a sector of, of trade that, in fact, profit from that sort of limitations. But that's unfortunately not the, the fair trade. That's not the regular, normal, uh, normal interaction in trade terms that profits, but rather the, a sector which is a bit grey or brownish or, or what have you. Um, now, um, socialist countries, also in Europe, tended to have that sort of, of limitations. And, and for instance, in Russia, this is still the case. For instance, in Russia, I cannot go to Russia and buy a piece of of, 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 of land there just, just as I wish I would uh, think I would need to establish an incorporated entity in, in Russia with a certain investment from my own part on my own part and then buy it in the name of that Russian legal person. It's not possible in China either, so we have tons of countries where this is still limited very much. Uh, now the European Union has tried to get rid of these, uh, these sort of limitations, uh, but uh, but is not entirely um, uh, successful in that because it recognizes also certain specificities in member countries that may apply and that has granted some exceptions. So for instance, in order to protect the Danish coastline from being bought up by, by German, uh, Germans who are like 10 times more than, than, than the Danes uh, and put up summer houses everywhere in Denmark, the uh, EU has made it possible for Denmark to have an exception that, that actually bars selling of, of beach line properties to, uh, to others than Danes. Uh, in Finland we have the autonomous area of the Åland Islands where only those who have the regional citizenship of the Åland Islands can own real property. Uh, that, that's, an, that's an arrangement that dates back to 1922 actually, 21, 22. It would not probably under human rights regimes of today be possible to set up that sort of a limitation of the ownership of real property. But that was done in 1921-1922. Uh, and certain indigenous populations, for instance, in the Nordic countries in Finland, uh, the Sami uh, population, has a certain have certain like small, slight regimes of, 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 of that, that inhibit uh, conveyance of, of real property uh, and so on. But, but these are clearly very slim exceptions. So broadly speaking, uh, the, the the tone of the day is to get rid of all of these sort of regimes and this is in particular the, 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 the object of all sorts of trade uh, organizations like the WTO and, and, um, and, uh, and the North American um, Free Trade Association etc. Precisely to get rid of this sort of inhibitions on trade because inhibitions on trade benefit someone but it's normally not the regular person but, but some other uh, business interest that has nothing to do with the, the regular life of normal people. Okay. Just a curiosity, because in Denmark, while it's not possible for Germans to buy off the coastline, they can actually create little firms in Denmark, and <laughs> through these little firms, so also in Denmark there are loopholes, um, <laughs> and through these little firms they can actually buy land and houses and all the rest of it, which they are doing uh, very happily. <laughs> I'm half German, by the way. <laughs> but don't have any, <laughs> any lands there. Just two quick points. One is, I'd like to use the question as a way of linking back to the discussion on internal flexibility of the Constitution. And then number two, just a quick point on what we've done, what work has been done in the area of um, constitutional and economic uh, or equity limitations. So on the first point, we had an interesting discussion earlier on constitutions, particularly of uh, more recent uh, vintage, for lack of a better term, having internal flexibility. Um, I'm not sure how many other constitutional law professors are here, but as I understand it, uh, we still teach it that our constitution is of the rigid kind, which means that uh, as a result of there being provisions that specify the manner by which we can change it, um, the idea is it's, it should be difficult to change rather than easy to change. And of course, we've seen that because not, notwithstanding efforts to change this constitution since its ratification, we've not seen any um, amendment to date, not even of the economic provisions. 
Um, and what I'd like to add there, and, and the economic provisions provide a perspective of looking at it, I think we derive some security from looking at our constitution as mandatory precisely because it's practically immutable, meaning uh, we feel secure that certain things that we don't want to change will not change because it's there. And part of that is the sense of security coming out of these provisions providing um, adequate level of protection for local industries uh, to render those local industries competitive because they will have to rely on Filipino capital and, and so on. So um, I think even if a good number of the population have not read this constitution, there is that faith in the constitution and that so long as its provisions are enforced very strictly and increasingly we're looking to uh, not all of the departments, but specifically the judicial department to do so. Uh, we derive some sense of security. Um, even if in practice, as uh, the panelists have mentioned, we may see less compliance or more breach that looks like compliance to us. So, for example, in the area of um, equity limitation for public utility operation, um, one, the Supreme Court said, well, you know, that only applies if you're operating, not if you're owning. So that, in a sense, liberalizes access to public utility facilities for foreign investors without breaching the constitutional requirement of 40% foreign equity limitation. And it wasn't until many years later, you have to realize these provisions are not new in the 87 Constitution. They were there in the 35 and even the 73 Constitution. But we didn't see an interpretation of the uh, meaning exactly of capital until just a few years ago. Um, which meant that um, the creativity that lawyers applied in structuring deals in order to give foreign investors some flexibility um, and some assurance on the return on their capital, we didn't really look at very strictly until the Supreme Court decided that case and said, well, that means um, ownership of shares that can vote uh, members of, of the board. Uh, although now lawyers are arguing whether it really refers to legal and beneficial or only legal um, ownership. So, you know, we, we have a sense of security that we're enforcing these very strictly to protect local industries, but we, maybe we need to look at the numbers in terms of how investment is coming in. Which goes into the second point that I'd like to share with everyone here is, um, this isn't the first time, as I mentioned earlier, but it may be helpful for us to refresh the work that was done almost 20 years ago by the preparatory, um, the preparatory Commission on Charter Change, PCCR, which was convened by former President Estrada. That particular body was led by former and the late Chief Justice Narbasa, along with our now Chief Justice Nelu Sereno. So the idea for that body was to actually look at the entire constitution and propose changes but because of, I'm not sure if it was budgetary or uh, time constraints, they ended up looking only at the economic provisions. Um, and one of the areas that they focused on was the impact of the equity limitations on foreign direct investment. And if I understand correctly, they found a correlation in terms of the level of FDI that we were receiving compared to other countries in the region, uh, making them propose uh, at the time uh, taking out entirely the Filipino first provision uh, in the constitution and then recommending uh, changes to the equity limitations. Uh, more recently, we've seen uh, Congress in the last, um, the last Congress, the 16th Congress, they actually already had a draft proposal to amend the economic provisions. And there are really two versions. One is to lift the limitations altogether uh, and the other ver version is, so sorry, the first version is to lift the limitations and then pass on the task to Congress. So Congress decides whether equity limitations should apply. Uh, the other version is to keep the limitations that the Constitution sets out until such time that Congress decides to modify it. So for example, for public utility, one version says there is no uh, foreign capital restriction altogether until Congress legislates such a limitation. The other version retains the 40% limitation, but then says it may be modified um, by an act of Congress. So uh, we 
we are approaching the end of our program. Um, we, uh, we, we were able to um, access the website, Constitution.net, so we, before we close. useful so that you can